So, um, welcome to the second time we're giving the new bean flight school. I hope the story is gonna flow a little bit better this time. Um, as I just said, the class will take about two hours and um, it will basically cover a lot of the initial things that you're gonna like be confused at when you first start PvPing in EVE and playing EVE in general. A um, little bit about myself, I'm a director of Pandemic Horde. Um, I mostly focus on the new player experience. Um, so that's also one of the reasons why I, uh, I want to give this class. The plan is to give this class every two weeks, uh, every three weeks at least. Um, that way we keep people informed. And um, basically this, this thing is going to be a work in progress. Each class I'm going to add slides, change the order a bit until it's, it's perfect. And then Eve changes and we can start all over again. So, a um, little bit of preface. I'm not awesome at Eve. Um, this is basically a collection of uh, information we've uh, gathered from the people in Horde, people in PL. Um, if you see things that you don't think is right, just speak up. If you have questions, just speak up. Uh, basically, we can make this, uh, this class better and better, but only with your feedback and help. Um, the, uh, the learning curve of EVE is pretty steep. Um, I think it's the reason why a lot of people uh, either don't get into PvE, uh, PvP or don't get into EVE at all. And uh, my hope is that uh, Horde can offer enough guidance and information to uh, change that a little bit. And uh, there's a lot of information out there, but it's not always as accessible and generally people need a link to it. So um, in the next two hours, an hour and a half, I hope to make your first few fleets uh, a lot more enjoyable. Uh, one, one preface less warning is that like every FC kind of leads their fleet differently. Um, so. If an FC tells you to do something and this class tells you not to do that something, you should be following the FC's instructions. Um, there, they need to like like any any complex thing. There, there are a lot of exceptions and uh, in, information from the FC or commands from the FCs generally overrule that overrule everything. Um, if things are unclear, again, just ask in fleet chat, ask in mumble. I will not be looking at uh, hitbox chat, uh, so uh, people can answer in there if they're watching, or otherwise, uh, yeah, join fleet or mumble. Um, FC, you will hear me saying the lot, stands for fleet commander and is basically the leader of a fleet. Um, smaller fleets have one, bigger fleets have three or four sometimes. Uh, if we look at our uh, Entosis campaign, for example, in CloudRing, we often have multiple FCs in charge of multiple groups or multiple support fleets. So the goal of this class, well, the before picture is pretty clear. You're trying to chase the FC around, like you're trying to chase the fleet around. You're, you're hearing all these different commands, these like these words you've never heard of or cannot bring in, in, in context with Eve. So uh, like we're going to try and uh, turn you into the right picture. Uh, which is basically someone that at least knows what he's doing, can follow instructions, and is having a good time. Um, that's, that's basically it. Um, so, first thing is how do you find fleets in Horde? We have planned fleets on the forums, um, which are always on top of the forums with timer boards. We have impromptu fleets which are, which are pinged on IRC, which is why it's important you are in Pigeon. Uh, IRC and Pigeon are kind of the same thing. Uh, IRC is the is a age old chat protocol, and Pigeon is the the client we tell new people to use because it's relatively easy to set up. So um, people will ping there if there's stuff to kill on the on dock, if there's fleets jumping into W four stuff like that. Um, sorry, did you have a question? Um, no, I'm just here to listen, pretty much. Okay, do you have the live stream up? 
not yet. What live stream? Um, join the fleet in the fleet finder. And in the message of the day there, you will see a link to the live stream. And then you can watch the class. Someone can also put it in the channel maybe in uh, Mumble so you can click it. Um, so I was talking a little bit about Fleet Finder just now. Uh, that's the third way to find fleets. For example, if there's a standing fleet up, um, you go to the little menu, you go to social, you go to fleet, and then you have the Fleet Finder up. Um, So this is the overview of the Fleet Finder. If you do have to create a standing fleet, which you should always do if it's not up, use these settings. Um, a lot of the like responses from um, from new players we, we get over time is like, I cannot PvP because I'm useless. I'm only flying a frigate. I, I don't know enough about fleets. I don't have enough skill points. Like these are a lot of the, the, the excuses that even I have used for years to not get into PvP. All of these things are untrue. Like you're not useless in a frigate. With Ewar you can like either uh, jam or damp out much more experienced pilots. And in a fleet there's very little they can do about it. In tackle, like it's a hard job, but anyone can do it with very various degrees of success. Um, it's a cheap ship and it generally nets you kills, so trading it is, is good. And even then, every, every ship counts, like frigates can have an eye impact, especially once you start learning how to, how to use them properly. Um, not knowing enough to join fleets is something that I hope that this class takes, takes away. But in a word, the philosophy has always been uh, learn by doing. We don't care if you're a day old, you have no idea what you're doing. Jump in a fleet, learn by doing. If you die, it's fine. Get another frigate. If you can't afford another frigate, we'll give you another frigate. Just learn by doing. Every death should be a lesson. Skill points, especially with our skill plans, mean very little. Like Skill points just mean which ships you can fly. More skill points mean you can fly more ships. But having 50 million skill points doesn't really make you that much better at flying a frigate or flying a destroyer. So with our skill plans you can uh, pretty easily get into all of our fleets with one exception which I'll get to later and even then we still try to accommodate people that don't have the skills required to, to join those fleets. Another important thing is that a lot of MMOs out there condition you to like have this philosophy that bigger is better in EVE, in my opinion, that is not the case. Like, a frigate isn't worse than a battleship. Sur sure, in certain situations it is, but rushing into a battleship does not mean making it to endgame in EVE. It's very important that people understand that buying a battleship when you're a month old and PvPing with it or even PvEing with it isn't necessarily a great idea. You will lose a lot of ISK if you lose it, and you will you will generally fly a frigate better or smaller stuff better than going in a big ship with minimum support skills. Support skills are skills that make you better at doing stuff. So for example, when you have the main weapon skill, things like tracking, uh, trajectory analysis, uh, missile skills, those skills impact how you fly a ship instead of just getting into the ship. Other games also condition you to an end game, and if there is not really an end game, if has a sandbox, and what you do in, in, in that sandbox is up to you. So I want to talk a little bit about the different fleets in Horde. We already talked about it a little bit. Um, like I said, planned fleets. Um, we basically set timers beforehand. FCs can f put timers in beforehand. It's nice to schedule your day around it. We have a few. Um, different things. You can put up a normal timer and we can put up hype timers as we call them. Um, hype timers are basically based around either big fights we can third party on, objectives we want to achieve. Basically they are indicators that we want a lot of people because there's going to be something big going on or there's a big objective we don't want to lose or stuff like that. 
Then we have impromptu flights, baby. Basically, uh, an, an FC wakes up in the morning. It's like, eh, I, f I feel like FCing. Let's ping uh, IRC and let's get a fleet going. This is also why it's important to be on IRC when you're when you're online or when you're available. Or I, 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 for example, have it on my phone. Like when there's content going on, like you might not always know about it, but if you're in in IRC, someone will ping for it, and you can then be the judge if you want to join or not. Then we have the standing fleet, which has uh, made a nice uh, return since we moved back into Null. It functions as a defense for redders, miners. You can hunt in systems close by. The goal is to, al to, to, to always have it up. And it's a nice way, uh, a nice and controlled environment for ne new people to learn how to pilot their ships. Because there's actually a little bit of downtime between fights and standing fleets. So when there are questions, you can address the questions, which is a very nice environment instead of when we're entosising some system and there's a little bit of time time dis, uh, constraint and the FC is dealing with 50 million things at once, trying to to c communicate with waffles and support fleets. And like generally those are not really the, the the type of fleets where you can really hold someone's hand and as an FC, there will still be plenty of people in fleet chat that will come for you and help you out in those situations when you when you ask for it. But the standing fleet is just a little bit more relaxed and uh, has no time 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 constraints to really help you out. Then the the, the, the fourth type and the last type of fleets that we run is uh, is, is a little bit of a special thing. Uh, we haven't done one in a while. We, we, we basically call them soft deployments, which are special fleets uh, organized by Horde leadership. Uh, we basically s ensure that there will be ships for handout uh, wherever we're going. All you need to worry about is getting yourself there, either by pod, by, in, by travel interceptor, which I will get to in a moment, by shuttle. Just get there and we will take, take care of your ships. So that's a nice and cheap way to uh, get in usually some big scale fights or to help out waffles or stuff like that. So, um, I've already pretty much covered this. What is a soft deployment? Uh, I'm gonna skip this. So basically, bigger scale uh, engagements. Um, it's important to note that no fleets in Horde are mandatory as, as like we're newbie friendly and uh, casual friendly, whatever you want to call it, group. So there are no mandatory op ops or fleets to attend to. There's none of that bullshit. Just show up when you want to. Uh, in general, hype, hype timers, we of course uh, appreciate big numbers, but there's no, no, uh, no obligation to help out or, uh, or log in. Now, one of these problems with these uh, soft deployments that we have from time to time is you, you need to get there. Well, the most effective thing, way to get there is generally a travel scepter. Uh, a travel scepter is an interceptor with an alignment time under two seconds, um, which will make you very hard to lock. Uh, by insta locking gate camp, and um, it's very fast to travel, so it means you're there nice and quick, right? So um, how do you do this? Well, you do this by utilizing modules like nanofibers, initial stabilizers, uh, some rigs, and generally, if you have troubles uh, getting your alignment time on on the two seconds. Uh, generally use EFT or Pypha to, to check that out. Just ask a newbie channel and, and, and there are plenty of people that, that, that can get you a fit. Um, if you cannot fly an interceptor, because that's quite a bit of training, right? Doing it in a shuttle, a frigate or a pod is very possible as well. Like, generally, you don't want to start out in your pod right away because you might get blown up along the way. But after you get blown up, you basically have a second life and you, and and you can continue in your pod. Generally, because there's so many people moving to the to the soft soft deployment area, getting there safely is is not a big deal. Because if war targets see like 30, 30 war of our war, war of, of our corp jump into a system, they're docked up and gone. So generally, not an issue. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, different types of fleet compositions that we run. Our main doctrine is still shields and missiles. Now we get a lot of questions about this, like why shield and missiles? Shield and missiles for Horde is a really easy way to get new players into PvP. Gun skills are kind of terrible to train because 
um, you need a certain amount of support skills to really be effective. Drones are kind of the same way. You need Drones 5 and a, a decently high level of drone interfacing to really become decent DPS. Uh, that isn't really the, really the case for uh, missiles or shields. Um, so because it's easier to train, we focus on that doctrine because that makes Horde more effective, that makes people more inclined to join and join open fleets and be useful. So up until today, I think that's still the, 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 the doctrine we, we use a lot. Um, we also have an armor doctrine consisting of Torexes, Celestres, and Executors. The Celestuses are for Ewar, and the Executors are for Logi, Torex are for DPS, close range DPS. This is a very fun fleet to, f to fly. Um, some of our FCs run it from time to time. Um, but if I had to put a number on it, I'd say once or twice a month, right? It's, it's, it's not as dominant as the, as the shield and, 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 and missile doctrine. Then we have the Black Ops fleets, which I want to point out is kind of tricky because you need to have a cloak uh, in order to really participate. Generally, what, what we do is we put a Black Ops ship at a, at, a, at a position. We send out hunters to scout for ships to kill. They put up a Sino, which I'll explain later. All the bombers go to the Sino and we blow shit up and then we go back. That means that generally those are the only fleet types that are kind of locked to one specific uh, skill plan, which is, I think at the end of 90 days, you can fly a bomber. Uh, I think a little bit under actually. Um, generally, we try to accommodate for uh, the lower skill point players in those fleets as well. We don't run them that often. Uh, but it is nice to get everyone to participate. And uh, you need to think about having the frigates then move with the fleet and going back. And they might die on the way back because they don't have a cloak. But like generally, we take care of that. Uh, lately, we've been running a lot of tier 3 destroyers. Uh, majority is sweep Sweeple and Jackdaws. Uh, we see some Confessors. Uh, Hakate is okay. Okay, but because it's very close range, I don't see it used that much. But in general, the call for most fleets are t t tier 3 destroyers. So if you can fly any, just bring that. If you can't, it's usually coupled with burst for Logi. Uh, why burst? Because um, um, it's faster than the site and can, can, can keep up with the tier 3 destroyers. And because it's Horde, like everyone can be an FC in Horde. Uh, if you want to fly another Doctrine, that's fine. Talk to a Market Seeder or, or, or seed it yourself. Post an op with, uh, with details of what to bring and go from there. There's one thing I want to point out. Um, in EVE you will hear very often like a kitchen sink. Basically a kitchen sink has no specific do doc Doctrine. Uh, members pretty much bring whatever ship they want. Uh, in really terrible doctrine um, kitchen sink fleets, you have a combination of armor and shield, and like weapons at different ranges. It can be a nightmare to FC, uh, and it's the reason why kitchen sink fleets are sometimes, for that reason, quite ineffective. For example, in the uh, as as a counterpart in our Tar War or Caracal fleets. Everyone is using missiles, right? And everyone's generally having the same range. Sometimes you 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 have the FC ask like, what's everyone's range? And then he kind of picks like a middle point in that, right? So, so so he knows knows at what point he can effectively engage. There's no way to do that if in a kitchen kitchen sink because there will just be too much spread between uh, the en en engagement ranges. Um, let's talk a little bit about fleet roles. Fleet roles. Um, there are a lot of fleet roles, but I'm only going over the the main ones. DPS, pretty self-explanatory. Applies damage. Tackle, light or heavy, holds the enemy in place, prevents it from running away. I'll cover this in detail later on. Scouts, they scout ahead, uh, scout into anomalies or like other places where ships can uh, can find. Scouts generally. Um, Fly interceptors, which also fill the role of tackle. Um, then we have Logi, which re re repairs the fleets during or after engagements. Um, a new player can pretty much fill all these roles in a relatively short amount of time. The hardest role 
uh, in my opinion, is Tackle and Scout. Um, but Tackle has a very low barrier of entry. But to be good at Tackle is really hard. Like, uh, that's, that's pretty much how, how, how I would put it. Um, you have Light Tackle and Heavy Tackle, which I quickly want to wanna highlight. Uh, light tackle, tackle are basically cheap disposable ships, and heavy tackle are well, generally either larger or more expensive ships with a, with more e EHP, where e EHP stands for e effective hit points, which basically means the amount of points that it takes for you to die. Um, yeah, that's the last part is pretty much all roles are needed on fleets. Um, I left out a lot of roles, dictors, stuff like that, um, e war, but that's pretty much like the the support section. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit later as well. So um, you figured out what fleets are, what roles there are. Now I want to go over like what do you need to to do before joining a fleet, ideally, right? So a little bit of preparation. Um, one advice, and this is just advice, it's not necessary at all, but if you feel un uncomfortable with joining your first fleet, speak up, let, let people know, either on Mumble, put in a fleet chat. Um, it's, it's generally nice for the FC to know as well if people are new, because if he has the time for it, it means he can explain, explain a little bit, little, little bit more as well. Also, generally, or fleets are pretty new being friendly, so FCs will take into account that there are people that are new, right? Don't be afraid to die. Like, that's part of EVE. Like I said before, every lesson should be a death. Um, that's, that's something good to take in mind as well. If you die in a fleet and you don't know why you died, try and figure it out with a more experienced horde member or your mentor. Um... Of course, sometimes you will die because you did something stupid, but that's still a lesson because you remember, oh, like, that was stupid. I shouldn't have done it that way. Um, so, second question. What the hell do I fly? Well, what to bring on a fleet is uh, generally in the message of the day, which you can see here. For example, this, in this case, uh, fleet types are Caracal, Sites, and any frigate. Generally, the thing at the last is the lowest priority, but something you can always fly, right? So generally, on any Horde fleet, you can always bring a frigate. Um, you can also always see it on the ping, although generally it's a little bit uh, shorter on the ping than in the, in the message of the day. Uh, so frigates might not always be, be included, but always assume if it's a Horde fleet, you're generally always okay to bring a frigate. Um, if you're unclear on what to bring or what is best, like say you can fly something more advanced, you want to fly something more advanced, but you're not sure if the FC wants to, just ask. Um, as I said, you can always bring a frigate. Some good frigates to, to be aware of are Molasses, Crucifiers, Slessers, Merlins, like small stuff that can still be useful, right? One thing to really take into account for the Merlins and the Slashers that we see on contracts and we, and we hand out to people is they're not fitted for DPS. The guns on there are terrible for DPS, but they're basically just there to have you, like, to have to give you something to shoot with, to give you something to, to, to get on kill mans with. But the primarily ro pr primary role of those ships is to tackle stuff, to hold stuff in place. Um, my advice is stay in cheap ships. Uh, like, don't rush into a caracal necessarily, because that's like 44 million. And for 44 million, you can get like what 20, maybe 30 frigates. So like that's 30 deaths at which you can get better at PvP or get a better understanding on what's what's going on in fleets. If you're too poor, like if you get to a point where you're too poor to fly something in Horde, speak up, ask for help. There are plenty of people who are willing to help you out. If not, the New Bean Initiative, which is the initiative I run, where we come for new players, will hook you up. It's only a matter of someone needs to be online and help you, and the corp hanger needs to be filled with the stuff to hand out. But generally, not having ISK and being broke shouldn't be a reason not to join a fleet. Of course, we do aim at giving people the tools they need to be ISK sufficient, 
but if you get into a situation where it's get that bad that you cannot join, we want you to join, so ask for help. Um, we already went over this a little bit, like, Logi is the highest uh, demand, then Dictors, then Caracals, then any frigate. So, getting ships. How the hell do I get my ships? Well, one sec while I get the animation going. So, one uh, service we offer, uh, well, we offer is actually all the members in Horde that are willing to, because it's, it's basically open to everyone, are our corp contracts. Basically, what we do is we... Oh, that was not intended. We uh, take away the barrier of finding a fit, making sure it works. Uh, like, that. that is hard for a new player, right? Because you don't know which, which models you should put on. Is this good? Is that good? And, like, there's a free fleet leaving, so you're under some time pressure. So, for this reason, we really like to seed stuff on corp, corp contracts. So, you can just basically go to the corp contracts, click on it, buy it, jump into it, and you're good to go. You know you're not flying something terrible. You might not be s flying something awesome, but the fit will be at least solid, right? So how do you do this? Well, you do this by going to the menu, going to business, going to contracts, then available contracts, then you make sure that uh, you set the availability to my corporation, current system, and then you just search what you're looking for. So in this case, uh, we get, if we don't search for anything, we get all the contracts, which is like generally like a few hundred, which is not a good, a good thing. So you, you type in site, for example, if you're flying Logi, uh, or Merlin, or Slasher, or whatever, and generally there will be stuff seated on contracts. That's that's the goal, at least. Uh, lately in W4, it's been not great, because uh, people are buying stuff faster than I can see it, but uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, some, some things to keep in mind. Contracts are a free market, so some prices might be unreasonable, then just don't buy it. Uh, consider seeding it yourself. Um, with our shipping service, it's actually quite profitable to start seeding stuff yourself. I hope to have a clause for that in the next two weeks as well, so we can like, kind of get people involved in that as well, because I think it's a nice way for some new players to make some ISK as well. Um, if there are multiple fits available of a ship, it will generally be in the description, which is not in this picture, but it's generally here. Um, so... For example, for um, treasures, if we have two fits, one is we call Dick Cats. I will put Dick Cats in the description, so you're sure that you're buying the right ship if the, um, the FC calls for it. It's always cheaper to buy the ships yourself, because like, the people bringing this in, the people fitting this, they are charging you markup. So, about bringing in stuff yourself. Um, we have a pretty awesome... Um, shipping service from Waffles, who ship next door to Oka Geigen. Um, and from there, there are services either into W4, or there's also today some services popped up to ship it directly to W4. Just check out our um, industry forums, and you can find out uh, how that works. I just want to quickly show you how to do it. Um, you create a contract, you set it on courier, you set it to private, and you Type in the name of the person that's shipping for you. In this case, it's the Corporation Waffle Shipping Network. Strategic Network. Sorry, I always misspeak mis that. Then you select what you want to ship and where you want to ship it to. This just still says Saranen, which is our like old area where we base out of, but that doesn't really matter. Then you put in the reward. Now, when it comes to the reward, um, generally, the the form threads will say what the reward will be. In the case of uh, waffles, it will be 250 ISK per M3. So if something is, uh, um, say, a hundred, a 160K uh, M3, you multiply, multiply that by 250, and you're pretty much good to go. That's what, the, the, what you put on the contract. Another important thing is don't put co collateral in for the shipping contracts because uh, that will pretty much get your contract declined and there are some general other rules, but just read the thread and you'll, you'll be sure. Other than that, the market in uh, W4, I see I forgot to 
rename this, but just assume this says W4 and this as well. <laughs> um, the market in W4 is actually a pretty good state. A, lo a lot of modules are up, so you can buy holes from the market, you can buy modules from the market. Um, my feeling is that it will generally still be a little bit cheaper than buying it from contracts. Um, and if you want something seeded, there's a thread on the forums that will basically hook you up uh, if you post there. There are, there are market seeders that are, are, are looking at that, so if you miss modules, post there and someone will bring it in the next couple of days. Oh, that's enough boring stuff. Oh wait, there's more boring stuff. So what ammo do I bring? Well, that's a question that a lot of new players always also always ask. Um, if you buy a ship from contract, just assume it has the right ammo. If not, the people who made the contract will eventually be screamed at, so it's fine. Um, faction ammo is best ammo. Faction ammo is generally more expensive ammo, but it's a huge, like, buff, essentially. It's, 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 it's better. Uh, exception is, I wouldn't put it in the Merlins and the Slashers, because they're just tackle frigates and DPS is not their role. Um, if you're unsure of what ammo to bring, ask someone, ask an FC, like what ammo should I put in my tower, uh, and people will explain. There will also be some cases where you're switching ammo types uh, during fights, because you're uh, against different re resists, so you want to use specific ammo type to do more damage. Uh, but the FC will generally call that, and if you don't have the ammo type, well, that's okay, just keep shooting what you're shooting. Um, for bomber fleets, you always use want to use the ammo type that your bomber has a bonus to. Um, that is on the description of the bomber, so it should be self-explanatory. By the time you can fly a bomber, this should be pretty familiar to you. Um, if you can overheat, which if you're a new character after today's patch or yesterday's patch, um, you can do that by default because it's in the new um, uh, basic skills that you get. Um, consider bringing some nanite repair paste because those allow you to repair heat damage of modules. I will explain what overheating is and how it works a little bit later. So, you got your ship, you're in a fleet, you found the fleet, you're ready to undock. And then generally the FC says something along the lines of undock and stop your ships. Now, why do we do that? this? The FC generally wants to take stock of fleet composition. The FC has a button that gives a nice overview if it works, of um, what the fleet composition is. So, how many caracals, how many logi, how many dictors, how many tackle. Um, so generally, they use this time to take stock of what they have. Do we, do we need more logi? Do we need some e-war? Do we need more dictors? Is there someone who brought a battleship in a fleet that makes no sense to have a battleship? Stuff like that. So how do you do this? Well, pretty simple. You press undock and then you press control space. Control space is a really important uh, keybind that everyone should know because it stops your ship. Um, there are also other ways to do this. For example, uh, some FCs gather on a gate. Other FCs go to a safe in space. Some of them will say, just warp to me. Um, rarely they tell you to go to another system, which is basically because uh, it's a waffle fleet and they're at Kanaka or something like that. But uh, generally, you should be good to go with that information. So, what about control space? Well, if you undock, you get something called a session timer. And a session timer occurs every time your session changes, which most commonly happens when you undock, when you dock, when, you, when your ship explodes and you enter in your capsule, when you jump a gate. Um, during the session timer, you are invulnerable um, and you're unable to change sessions. The unable to the 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 invulnerability part is pretty pretty clear, but the session change is kind of important. Say you jump into a gate, and you freak out because you see enemies, and you right away go back to the gate and you want to jump through it. If you do that within the ten seconds, that means that you one will lose the invulnerability because you did something other other than con press control space because that's the only action you can do without losing your session timer. And you will, basi will basically end up at zero on the gate, but not able to jump because this little icon isn't away yet. So this is the session timer. timer. Pretty, pretty important to, to be aware of. So again, all actions except stopping your ship that have an impact on your ship. So turning the camera around will not 
will not cancel the session timer. But clicking in space to, to go somewhere or aligning to a stargate will cancel that invulnerability, which is a pretty important part. Uh, one, one distinction to make is that the invulnerability and the session timer are kind of split. For this explanation, I just want to throw it on one pile because otherwise we can get into a little bit of a complex uh, situation. Then, um, something to be mindful of, always rename your ships. First, how do you rename your ship? You click on your capacitor, right click on it, set name, uh, and then you type in a name. Why? Well, if you look at dscan, which is a tool that lets you scan everything near you, uh, from this, right, we pretty much know that little Stannis is flying in near us. Uh, but we don't know the pilot who is flying in Ocator. So your character uh, name in your ship gives away Intel over D-Scan, which is generally not a good thing. It's not the end of the world if you don't do it, but it's good practice to always do it. Uh, this is also the reason why ships and contracts generally always already have a preset name that does, doesn't include a character. Um, so, um, you renamed your ship, you're in space, everyone's having, well, not fun yet, but we're, we're getting ready to have fun. Um, now DFC says something weird, right? He says, everyone X up. And he's, you're like, wait, what? what? What does this mean? Like, this is, this is a situation that sometimes happens. Um, so, they, will, they can tell you to X, L, or D up. There are some variations, but basically they, they will tell you to put a letter in chat. Why? Well, it can function as a ready check. It can function as like how many people are flying Logi. Um, FC needs someone to, to, to like do something, like a volunteer. Or FC needs 10 people to go to another system. So he tells people to X up and will basically cut the line somewhere and say, well, everyone above this person goes there. Uh, and it's used to organize people on watch list. But I will get to that a little bit later as well. So how do you do it? You put the the letter in chat that was called for if it's relevant to you. So if you're not flying Logi and the FC tells you to, to X up or L up, mo most of the cases, if you fly Logi, you don't put an L in chat, obviously. Uh, it's important that you don't talk in fleet chat during those times because it's kind of hard to then see. So just shut up for a moment then. Next thing is watch lists. And this is generally why Logi uh, else up other than the count. Watch lists are in a separate window where you can add up up to 10 people in a nice window that lets you pretty much use all fleet actions on that window. So you can warp to them, you can uh, control click them to lock them, stuff like that. And you see the structure armor and shields. So um, for Logi pilots, you always want to have your other Logi pilots on watch list. Any tackle and dictor pilots you want to have on your watch list. And everyone in the fleet, you want to have your FC on the watch list and you want to have anchors on the watch list. And whoever the FC tells you to have on the watch list at that point because they're a scout or you're, there's something you, someone you need to warp to or stuff like that. Um, that's all I want to cover for watch list for now. I think we're going to dive into that a little bit later as well. No, we're going to do that right now, actually. So how do you do that? Well, there are actually three ways to do that that I can think of. The first one is from Fleet Chat. So basically, someone uh, someone will say, I'm, I'm, I'm Xing up in Fleet Chat. And the FC will say, say, like, put that person on watch list. So you right click on that person's name and you say, add to watch list. It's that simple. You can also do it from the members list or the, the, the fleet window or from uh, court window. Just right click on the person with the little pink icon, which indicates that they're in the fleet. And you do the same thing and you can do it from the fleet window and you will then also get a nice little overview of what the watch list looks like. As you can see, you can do all the options here that you, that you would normally do. Uh, although we're docked now, so you don't see the warp to and align to options. Uh, a tip for Logi, for the people new, new to flying Logi, control clicking on your watch list, so control clicking over here, will basically lock your target. Quickly checking on the time. Yeah, okay. Um, another nice thing is uh, putting your 
Fleet Chat into Compact Mode, which basically means that you don't see the annoying little avatars on the chat. It also pays off to have that in local because that way you can see more people in the window and you have a better understanding of who's in the fleet and you can easily find people because it's uh, ordered alphabetically. You can even type in here as well. So uh, if you have a huge fleet of 100 people and you're looking for call, just type in K-A-L and boom, you, you, you have me targeted. Um, so that's nice. So how do you do that? Like how do, how, how do you get, a, get away with the little portraits? You click on the three people and you do show com compact member list and you're pretty much there. Um, so. Another thing we need to set up is our fleet window. Um, when we have a fleet up, um, an important aspect of the fleet is the fleet history window. I will cover that a little bit in a little bit more detail, but because we're in the preparation stage, I want to make sure that everyone knows how to set their broadcast settings. So for the role of DPS, EWAR, and Tackle, um, that generally means this. You go to settings, broadcast settings, then you get a nice little overview of all the broadcast types. And you basically want to have target, warp to, align to, add location, jump to, and travel to uh, up. You can see, you, you can set the colors as well, which will affect the colors in the overview. Um, there's some other things you might sometimes turn on, but these are the things that I advise you to have on at the very least. If we look at the same setup for uh, Logi, and this is mostly up to personal preference as well, um, we can do the same thing. So um, you get the broadcast settings again, and then you can either leave target on or off, and you can put on need shield and need armor, because that's how will people will broadcast that they need to be healed. Um, a lot of Logi pilots keep both on. Other Logi pilots will not, or will only keep one on. If they're in the armor fleet and they're repairing armor, they will not look at shield broadcast. In Horde, I would advise everyone to have both on because people will miss broadcast and do shield instead of armor because they're freaking out. Um, so that's that's generally good to um, to do. Then another thing you're setting up. This is basically all one time, right? This is not something you need to do every fleet. I know it looks like a lot, but these are things that have shown over the past that people didn't do and they got lost. Actually, lost is a good good intro for this. So when this setting is wrong, um, and we're going, especially when we're traveling through high sec and low sec, uh, we run into the issue that some people got lost. And that's because, especially when we search, first started towards, um, we weren't always aware that people's routes are different when they start the game than when we've been playing the game for a long time. So what you want to do is you want to um, click on the little A here so it expands. And then you generally always want to have the prefer shorter option on. By default, it's on prefer safer, which means that if the FC wants to uh, have, take a specific route and he wants the entire fleet to take that route, then having the wrong navigation settings will basically, for example, in this case, if you have it on prefer shorter, will not take any low, low sec or null gates, which means, for example, you end up with 50 jumps where the main fleet ends up with 11 jumps. Then you get split off the fleet and you will pretty much have a bad time. Um, sometimes an FC will tell you to set up different um, routes, so it's important you note that you need to change it to prefer shorter and sometimes you need to change it by instructions of the FC, but it's very rare. Um, one minor adjustment for your overview. Um, and I'm going to assume here that everyone went through the core bulletin and installed their overview. I'm not going to pronounce it because I'm going to butcher that and do the person injustice. But like, install this overview. Um, your main overview will generally be normal PvP. Normal PvP. And you might want to play around with brackets. Now, what are brackets? Brackets are the little brackets around everything in space, um, which generally gives you a lot of overview of the fight, a lot of overview of your allies. If you're new and um, the overview in EVE can be a little bit of a hassle to, to start out with, I advise you to go to right click on main, load presets to brackets, and then just show all brackets. This will be very cluttered in very big fights. Um, 
but until you get a little bit more comfortable with how Eve works, it at least makes sure that you don't miss anything. Um, if you, for example, use some of the predefined PvP brackets, you will end up with not seeing your allies, which gives you a very insecure feeling if you're if you're in the right spot. So um, I advise that you just do that, and then once you get more comfortable, start tweaking your brackets and add or remove what you don't want. For example, drones is in a lot of cases something you want to remove. Um, Three updates ago already, we got uh, new uh, overview icons. If you're new to Eve, you don't have to go to the awful transition to uh, to relearn your instincts of certain icons. Um, generally, point of rule, the rule of thumb is um, the pointier their icon, the more firepower the ship has, uh, and you can see that here, industrial ships are not pointy at all. And here it basically becomes from a little triangle to a huge triangle. Or two triangles, actually, or arrows. Um, the distinction between players and NPC is also always good to understand. But generally, you will not, not mistake an NPC for a player. Uh, I, I kind of included this just for reference, so I'm not going to go over all of them. Um, one final thing that's actually like one of the most important things, please set this up because in big fleets it's it can be so messy. Um, in Mumble you should have two push to talk keys. And the reason for this is one push to talk key is to talk to everyone, no matter which, which sub channel they are. And the other is to only talk within your group. And the reason for this is because you have often split up your fleet in different support fleets. They de de often take a separate channel so they can talk among among each other. And if you then use your broadcast, your, your, your shout button, that means that everyone hears it and you're interrupting other conversations. So it's really important that you set up a separate whisper key and use that when people tell you to whisper instead of shout. So how do you do that? Um, you go to settings, and then you go to keybinds, uh, shortcuts, you add the keybind, and then uh, you go to whisper slash shout. In this case, it's a whisper, and then you say shout to channel, which is really weird, but just click it, and then you say current channel, and then you press the keybind. So when people tell you to start whispering and not shouting, they mean to use that keybind. Um, I use home and page up and bind those two buttons on my uh, mouse, but that's kind of up to everyone to uh, to do. Really, really important that you uh, that that you get that done. Another thing, um, safety options. By default, it's on green. This little icon is on green, which will basically prevent you from committing any illegal act. Um, that isn't really a issue in null, but in low sec it can be an issue and ends up with you not being able to target. So uh, how do you cha change your uh, ch safety uh, settings? You basically click the little icon and you click what you want to have your safety on. My advice is to just turn safety off and think what you're doing. Like think what the consequences of engaging at that point are. Are you in low sec? Will you get aggro from gate guns? Are you in sec? Doesn't matter. Did you just jump a gate from low sec? And are you suddenly in high sec? Will Concord attack you if you engage that person? Just have a look at the security status. Because, I don't know. Personally, I just find it really annoying that I have to change my safety just before I do something. So I just live with the fact that I'm going to have to double check if I'm actually in the right system. Because sometimes it can be really hectic, right? You're chasing someone through low sec, suddenly you're in high sec, and you're like, okay, I finally got him, and then, well, Concord comes and ruins your day. Um, that kind of, like, adds... Okay, I actually didn't explain that yet. But partial safety will only give you suspect flags, and by disabling safe safety, you can get a criminal flag. So, what are these flags, right? Well, sus suspect flag allows any other player to attack you without penalty for the duration of the timer. Uh, gate, ga gate guns will attack you, and the 
and the attacker will not receive a, 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 a reduction in security st standings, which basically means you can go suspect without losing security standings. If you go suspect on the gate in low sec, you will be fired at. So um, how do you get this? Well, targeting a player uh, with an offensive module, so something like Ewar, you fire a gun, you tackle him, you web him, stuff like that. All these terms I will explain later, so no, no, no worries about understanding that right now. Uh, will give you suspect flag, and stealing a container will also provoke a flag, but uh, stealing from a container will also provoke a flag, but not generally not an issue in Horde. So we get this timer, and at that point if you jump into um, uh, high sec, I think people can attack you, but I'm actually, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Then you have the criminal flag, um, which is basically the same thing. Uh, but people can, like, they will not have any penalties. Uh, you you acquire a criminal flag by uh, activating any module against the player's capsule. So not the ship, but the capsule. And for directing any other player with a criminal flag at that time. Um, quickly, very briefly, a little bit about squad commanders. Um, the way a fleet is uh, set up is you have wings, you have squads, uh, and above that you have a fleet commander. You need certain skills to fill those uh, spots, and filling those spots are important because that's the only way you can... Uh, um, how, do you say, how do you say that? Propagate buffs down. Um, I'm very briefly going to go into this because it's mostly... The, the, basically, the only thing you need to know is don't take leadership positions if you don't have the leadership skills. So don't go into the fleet commander slot if you have, don't have fleet command skills. If you don't go into wing command if you don't have the wing command skills. Don't go into squad command if you don't have leadership skills. And generally, you want them maxed because that will give the maximum amount of space in, in that unit and will propagate buffs to the maximum amount of peoples. Um, so if we then look at how those boosts works, so the boosts are the, the, the buffs that get passed down. Um, so in order for boost to flow, there must be a person in a squad. That squad must have a squad commander. Uh, you don't have need to have a wing commander if you only have one squad. Uh, so, but if you have more than one squad, you need a, need a wing commander. And if you have more than one wing, you need a fleet commander. Um, so what are these buffs? Well, they basically they're here. I'm not going to go over them, but a lot of the times these things, these buffs, make a world of difference, especially if you combine them with the modules, uh, which is generally called a, a, a fleet booster, booster role. They basically fly a ship that buffs your, um, buffs your fleet, and those also have modules that further increase the uh, bonuses that the fleet gets. That's all I want to talk about this, because it's a little bit advanced. Uh, just know that it exists, and to not take the wrong spot. Um, very briefly about Logi, because we have separate classes on that, and like we already have enough to go over today. Um, l l logistics focuses on rem repairing damage from members, either shield or armor. Generally, you do not mix Logi. So you have a fleet that is shield-based, and you um, take shield logic. You have a fleet that's armor based and you take armor logic. Um, some things to, to note. Again, put an L in chat when you have FC, FC asked for it. When you see people putting L in chat, you want to add those people to watch list so you can keep your logi brothers alive. Um, set up your history uh, for logi. Join the logi channel. If people, if it's necessary for the fleet, um, not going to go into that in detail. Just join the ten channel and ask why the channel is there if the situation arises. And sometimes people will go to a separate channel on Mumble, um, so they can talk to each other and kind of communicate like how to organize Logi and like split Logi if it's if it's needed. One more advice, FC will generally tell you to pre-lock them if you're logy, 
This is because that means that you can see their health all the time. You have him pre-locked so you can instantly um, throw him reps if needed. Um, even if the FC doesn't tell you, just pre-lock the FC. Like keeping the FC alive is top top priority, especially in Horde, where people aren't always capable or willing to step up if the FC goes down. Um, so um, that is important. FCs are big targets uh, to, to to be taken out. Also got headshots. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So um, that's the boring um, preparation part. Let's uh, let's get to actually a flying part where we're gonna go into a little bit more mechanics, uh, some basic things for fleet movement and stuff like that. Um, first things first, setting the destination. Uh, so basically uh, the FC will tell you like we're going here and sometimes that's straight to the destination where you're going, sometimes he's going in a specific route and he's gonna tell you first go here and then he will give you a second destination. Don't Don't be surprised by that. Uh, so how do you do that? Well, basically, FC Scorio puts in uh, chat, uh, go to FNMX6. Uh, and then you right-click that uh, that system and you, and you put uh, set destination. That's that simple. simple. Uh, sometimes it's already in the MOTD. Um, don't be, like, how do you say that? Hesitant or, like, annoyed that you have to, like, 50 or 30 drums. Like, searching for content is a vital part of fleet combat. Like, searching for targets to kill, finding other fleets that are out. Like, the more jumps you make, the more likely it's going to be that you're going to get a fight. Sometimes it takes three and you killed two billion and it's time to head home already. Other times, uh, it takes you 20 and you're still like, okay, there's no one here, let's get back. And then one jump out from going home, you suddenly encounter a fleet. And you still get dank kills. So, like, making jumps is part of searching content. It's it's that simple. Um, when an FC tells you to anchor up, um, what does that mean? Well, the anchor is basically in a fleet the person that leads the f the roller the the fleet around and positions the fleet both during combat and uh, directly before combat. Um, this is often the FC. Uh, sometimes it can also be someone else. Um, there are a few ways to do this. Uh, some FT FCs want you to approach, others want you to orbit, others want you to keep at range. Generally, if you're unclear how the FC wants you to um, to anchor, um, just ask. Um, nine times out of ten in Word, I think people use approach. Um, there's sometimes different anchors as well. Uh, having a separate Logi anchor is uh, ideal if you want to split your split your Logi from your main fleet and keep as much distance between the enemy and your Logi because the Logi anchor, anchor will uh, mostly keep you positioned behind your own fleet and have the enemy fleet at the other side. Um, so make make sure you anchor up. That's uh, that's really important. So um, then we could continue to aligning. Um, a lot of the times an FC will tell you align to planet 6 or align to this and this gate. Uh, two ways to do that. Um, you go to the overview, you right click and you do align to. You right click in space if it's a... Uh, uh, a planet, an asteroid belt, a stargate, or a station. You go to the station, for, as for example, or stargate in question, and you do a line two. Um, why do we do this? Well, there, there are a few reasons, but the most important reason is um, in EVE, you only start warping when you're above 75% of your maximum speed. Uh, which means to get people to warp as a fleet quickly, you want everyone already moving in a certain direction. Um, the other reason is that the FC, for example, wants everyone to um, burn out a bubble. I will explain what a bubble is a little bit later. But a bubble is basically a place you're stuck and the fleet needs to get out of it. The FC generally wants to keep the fleet together, right? So the FC will tell everyone to align to the same uh, position and then kind of go out in that position and after that 
like they're still all together and they can either warp or they can reposition or they can engage or stuff like that. Um, the third situation that comes up regularly is you want everyone already pre-aligned, ready to warp out, but you still want to have some extra time where you can shoot stuff. Um, those are the most m most common situations. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about tackle. So what is tackle? Well, tackle is basically preventing someone from warping. And you do this by m with uh, modules, warp scramblers and warp disruptors. Uh, the warp scrambler is shorter range, but has a, head of, has a strength of 2. The warp disruptor has a longer range, but has a strength of 1. And I'll, I, will, I will explain what the strengths mean a little bit later. Um, in order to warp, and this is the important part, you must overcome the warp strength that is being put onto you. Um, and a nice tip, control clicking this icon when you're tackled will uh, select the person that's tackling you. Because generally killing that person off or getting as far away as possible from that person is uh, what you want to do. So what is this strength? Well, it's called warp, warp core strength. And warp core strength is basically the measure uh, uh, is a measure of the ability to warp while being warp scrammed. So, for every warp strength that's being put onto you, uh, you can have one uh, strength against you. Wow, that's I've totally screwed. Last time I was messing with this as well. Let's try that again. I'm just going to read it, actually. That's probably better. Warp strength is a measure of the ability to warp well warp scrambled. For every point in warp strength, you can have one point of warp scramble on you and still successfully warp off. So what is it, does this mean? It basically means that if you have two uh, warp strength and uh, someone puts a warp scramble on you, which is minus two points, um, you can still warp away because the total is zero. And the total needs to be plus one. Um, generally, all ships don't, m most ships don't have a base warp uh, strength. You can add that with warp core stabilizers. Um, that's basically all I want to cover. Um, it's just important for you to know that there are points in play and that sometimes you can warp away and sometimes you can't, and why that is. Um, so, all this talk about warping. Um, there are two types of warping. Self-warping and fleet warping. Self-warping, just what it sounds like, you warp yourself. Fleet warping is the FC, squad or wing commander uh, warps the entire fleet. So, as I said before, there's what, what some things to take, take into account when warping. You only warp when you're at 75% of your current speed. This means if you have micro warp drives and afterburners up, that will impact when you warp. Um, entering warp can be prevented by warp scramblers and disruptors. You cannot warp but in a warp bubble, that's a blue bubble, you will see those later. Uh, you can be pulled out of warp by warp bubbles, we will discuss this later as well. And the, sp the speed at which a fleet warps uh, is used to dictate the is dictated by the slowest ship. So um, if you have a frigate fleet and there's one slow battleship in there, then the entire fleet of a f of uh, when fleet warping will warp at that speed, which is not great. Um, which brings us to uh, hey, what? Oh, okay. Never mind. That's the next slide. We'll 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 get back to that in a moment. So first, let's cover some things you can warp to. You can warp to fleet numbers, stargates, celestials, planets, bookmarks in space, and wrecks. The the, the wrecks are are primarily important because what happens a lot is there there's there there are two flights uh, two fleets battling and we're trying to third party, and we're basically f waiting for a good wreck to appear where we can warp to. Um, you can warp at ranges from 0, 10, 20, 30, 50, 70, and 100 kilometers. One little thing to, to understand here is that in order to warp, you need to be 150 km, uh, is it? Yeah, 150 kilometers away from the target. Is it 100? I 
think it's a hundred. Sorry. But you can still warp um, to all those ranges. So um, you can make smaller uh, jumps than listed here. Um, so how do we warp? Well, we right click on the overview. And then we basically s select where we want to warp to. Or you can select Celestials in space. And you can pretty much do the same thing. Then we get to the part I already wanted to explain, which is how to deal with the situations where your uh, slow ass battleship is slowing the fleet uh, warps down. Um, the battleship can exempt himself from fleet warp, which you do by doing this. I'm going to play that again because I had the wrong focus. So you go to the little options uh, lines and then you select accept from fleet warp. Uh, warp. Then you have this little icon, which indicates that you will no longer be warped by the wing commander. Um, this is generally used for boosters, for scouts, and slow ships that slow the fleet down. Um, another thing to cover is while traveling, you want to make saves. Um, what is a save? A save is a random spot in space. There are actually a lot of different types of saves, but for this course, we're just going to call it a save. And a save is basically a spot in space that isn't near any celestial or thing anyone can warp to. Um, so, for example, you are here at the moment, and you want to warp to this location, and you basically want to make a bookmark in the middle of this. So how do you do that? Well, initiating warp from here to here, you press Ctrl B, which will put up the bookmark window and then um, you already type in a name and stuff like that I think I have a screenshot of that later um, and then when you're in the middle you hit enter and in warp that will basically be your bookmark and then you can when you land here you can warp back to the bookmark and you're basically in a safe so that's how you create saves it's good practice to do this while warping during the fleet because you might be on the way back later and get jumped by a fleet and then having a save in every system or multiple saves is uh, very useful will definitely save you a few deaths so um, how do you make a save well basically how i just explained but uh, this is the window you will see when you press ctrl b um, and it will basically be a nice spot for you to regroup to um, say you're in a, in battle you take a lot of damage, but you're not warp scrambled, and you want to warp off. If you don't have a save, you're pretty much forced to go to an asteroid belt, warp to a planet. Now, well, you're panicking a bit because you're already getting a structure, um, so you warp to zero. Or you, you know, let's assume you warp to zero because that's not a good thing. If, if you end up doing that, at least warp at a semi-random distance. That way they have to guess where you warp to. Um, so they will actually see which direction you go, so they can kind of guess where you're gonna land. Especially if it's uh, if there's only one in 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 that direction, some of the enemy fleet might chase you. You land on zero in say the asteroid belt. They still tackle you and you still die. If you would have warped out to a safe, they might be seeing in which direction you go, but there's no way they can follow you besides uh, scanning you down. Uh, that's why it's important when you're in a save to hit the scan. If you see combat probes, it's time to move to the next save and then just bounce around. Uh, generally, don't reuse saves, especially if you waited a bit and then you saw combat probes because it's likely that they found your save. Um, something to prevent um, being scanned down in by combat probes in a save is called a rolling save. And basically how this works is the FC will tell um, a fast ships, generally an interceptor, to burn uh, into random directions, uh, burn away 150 kilometers from the fleet. So that answers my earlier confusion. You can only warp to something when it's 150 kilometers away from the target. Um, every time the interceptor is ahead of the fleet by 150 kilometers, the entire fleet jumps to that person. And then the interceptor starts burning in another direction. 
Why does he start burning it into another direction? Because there are ways for the enemy fleet, if he keeps burning into the same direction, lazily, to anticipate uh, where he's going to be and come into from the other direction, jump at 100 kilometers and land on, 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 on top of the fleet. So um, that's why it's, uh, it's in, in a random direction. And you can basically repeat this, this as long as necessary and it ensures that even when the enemy fleet is scanned down, generally you will already be so far away from the initial point because the fleet is moving that it doesn't really matter. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about yellow boxing and red boxing. Um, because you will hear it a lot of comes like he's yellow boxing, he's red box. Well, generally people will then say he's aggressed, and that's what 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 it is about. Because if people are red boxing you, it means that the entity is attacking you. If they're yellow boxing you, they haven't done anything yet; they just targeted you. Now, this is how it will look on your uh, brackets in space, and this is how it will look on your overview. Generally, when you see an entire fleet yellow box you, already start broadcasting for repairs, because otherwise they will not land in time. Um, that brings us to broadcasting for reps. So always broadcast early. That's important. Make sure you have in your history window, you have this icon, which sets that you broadcast to everyone. I think this is default, but just ensure that you haven't messed around with the interface and clicked it wrong. And uh, then what? Well, if we want to broadcast for armor, we click this little button. Actually, you shouldn't click the button, but for the sake of argument, you should click the button button. If you want to do shield, you do the button next to it. And if you're logy, it's nice to clear the history when everyone has gotten their repairs so you're ready for the next uh, wave of broadcast. Generally, you only want to broadcast for shields if you're in a, in a shield fleet and armor if you're in an armor fleet because your buffer for the other two, uh, for the opposing armor, uh, armor or shield type, is not going to save you anyway. Um, do not broadcast bomb damage. Uh, and the reason for this is the following. Say the following scenario. You're in Drake's. You're being bombed by Waffles. And your Logi is trying to keep you up. Uh, everyone starts uh, broadcasting because they take bomb damage. But there's another fleet who is actually primarily targeting one of your uh, members of your fleet. Because everyone is broadcasting, Logi has no idea who is actually the primary target of that fleet at the, at the moment. Which means one after another, Logi will not catch reps on the person that's the primary target. And that's a very effective and quick way to lose a lot of people. Because bomb damage isn't going to necessarily kill you. But not, not catching reps on the primary target is certainly going to kill someone. So you don't uh, broadcast bomb damage. What you do is you overheat your hardness. And you wait until there's a time to start broadcasting for uh, repairs again. And generally, uh, Logi will already start locking people and re repairing bomb damage. And after that, people will tell you, now broadcast if you still need repairs. Um, consider setting up a hotkey for repairs, because clicking here is uh, kind of awful. So... It's actually not consider, it's just set hotkeys for uh, broadcasting. Um, how do you do this? Oh, not so fast. Um, you go, you press escape, you go to shortcuts, you go to navigation. I know it's weird, why is it navigation? But okay. And then you set a hotkey here. There are kind of two options. You can put separate hotkeys for neat shield and neat armor. Or you can make sure that you swap the hotkeys if you're in an armor fleet or, sh or shield fleet. Um, that's kind of up to you. Uh, you need to remember it if you choose to use one hotkey, because no one, no one might see see your shield broadcast if you're in an armor fleet. Generally, people will see, but like it's still annoying if people uh, broadcast the wrong thing because you're not sure if they're actually either misclicking or if they actually need uh, the repairs. I want to talk a little bit about hotkeys because um, that's actually also a lot more effective than clicking a lot of the things. If you hold A and you click something on your overview or on brackets, although that's kind of prone to misclicking, you will start aligning to it. Um, you will do the same with Q, but then it's called approach. 
um, with the difference is that approach will keep you going and a line will basically keep you going in, in, into that direction and not change course if the target change, changes course. Um, with D, you dock and jump. So D on a gate, you jump. D on a station, you dock. Um, e, you keep at range. Um, control clicking on overviews or on the history window, which we showed before, will lock the target. W is orbit. S is warp 2. Um, F is attack uh, drones. And shift R, something you want to, when you get into drone comms, something you want to burn into your memory. If you don't want to lose your drones, always shift R when it's time to leave. Um, consider learning the, 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 the actions you use a lot and use the keybinds. Either set the keybinds separately or like make them to your personal preference, it doesn't matter. But it's less prone to mistake and it's, it's a lot faster in many, many cases. Um, so we're, we're talking for a bit and we're finally getting to the, sh to the shooting part. Um, so FC, what the hell do I shoot? Well, the FC will generally be um, be calling this out a mumble and broadcasting it in the history window. We we talked a little about a little bit about the history window before. Um, here you have a, uh, a confessor and a sweeple being uh, broadcasted. So in this case, you always target the last thing in uh, on the list, right? Um, if the target changes, you s you switch targets. The FC will almost, or the target color will generally always say it in mumble. Uh, there are a few ways to do this. Some will say full names. Others will only say two letters. Always stay on target, like always swap targets, um, unless free fire is called. Um, you can also use clear history, this button again, to get some overview again. Um, if you prefer that, it's up to personal preference. But it's really important to stay on target. Sometimes it might not make sense to to uh, switch targets. Say someone's always de uh, almost dead, and you're like, okay, I almost got him. When the FC calls switch targets, you still switch targets, because nine times out of 10, the FC will know that the Logi will uh, catch reps on that guy, and he wants to take advantage of that. So he wants to put as much damage to another target, so that target can actually go down fully. Um, this is a game that's generally played on FC level, and people kind of need to just have trust in the FC that he knows what the hell he's doing. Um, which brings us to uh, primary and secondary. Um, generally, the FC when when target calling will say primary is X, secondary is Y. What does what does that mean? Well, primary is the target you put all your DPS on, and the secondary target is the person you already like lock up to be ready to kill him when the primary goes down. Why is this important? Well, target switching is very important. Having someone pre-locked saves valuable time to start applying DPS again. We talked a little bit about overheating already. Um, the skill you require for that is thermodynamics. As I said, um, it's in the 14 day skill plan, um, which is going to be 10 days when um, after, like if you create a character today, because CCP changed the, uh, the, the ways that uh, the skills that the starter uh, characters uh, start with. So thermo thermodynamics will now be included from day one. What, the, what does this enable? Well, basically this enables you to overheat modules. Uh, all modules that can be activated um, can be overheated. Um, what does that do? Well, in the case of a warp disruptor, it increases the range by 20%. So if you have a range of 10K, suddenly you have a 20% bonus to that, which is pretty significant. For a rocket launcher, you have a um, rate of fire bonus, which basically means that you fire 15% faster, so more damage. Um, for afterburner, you have 50% more speed, which is great as well, right? That's 50% faster than you, than, than you were going before. Now, of course, it comes at a, as a, at a cost, and you see that with heat damage. And this heat damage goes down the higher level your thermodynamic skills as well. But you basically, when you overheat, you will see uh, it light up, which means it's overheat. And the more cycles it runs, the more damage you will get, which is this red thing. Each consecutive cycle that you run heated will apply more damage. If the entire circle is red, it will burn out, which means 
you generally only want to cycle like one cycle on one cycle off one cycle on one cycle off or when you're like almost dying you overheat everything or when the fc just tells you to overheat and kill the kill the target like don't burn out your model but that doesn't mean do it one cycle it means get the job done um you can repair this heat damage with uh, nanite, nanite repair paste you right click on the target and there's an apply option again very important to use hotkeys shift and your model hotkey module hotkey which you can rebind but by default it's, it's f1 will overheat it doing it again will stop overheating it so that makes it very effective to toggle on and off another kind of pro tip something that you don't really read well something that doesn't get handed to you on a silver platter is offline models or empty slots function as heat, heat sinks what this means is that it, it reduces heat damage. So say I have three slots. I put uh, two weapons in each and I leave the slot between it empty. Um, the guns will then take less heat damage. It's that simple. Except no one tells you it's that simple. Um, I want to talk a little bit about timers. You have weapon timers. Um, when you fire at, at another player, you will get a weapon timer uh, of a minute. And this has a few consequences. You are unable to dock, and you are unable to jump stargates. This isn't only when you shoot players, by the way. This is also when you shoot NPCs. Um, and you have to capsule a log off timer. The log off timer happens when you're involved in combat, and you cannot log off safely for 15 minutes. Uh, we will talk about what a safe log off is a little bit later. Your ship will stay in space. If you do disconnect, your ship will stay in space until this timer expires and then your ship will disappear from space this is kind of to prevent people from alt f which you're aware of, uh, uh, probably aware of when you played games like daisy and uh, other shooters that have some persistent uh, persistence in it um so what to do when enemies die well first it's time to cheer because they died second if you get the little notification windows uh, there's a little icon that looks like this in your bottom right by default. Um, and you get a pop-up from a kill report. Open up the notification window. Drag the click rep uh, the kill report to the fleet window. And um, that will link the kill to, to everyone in the fleet. Um, that will, one, let people know what they just killed. Because that's something people always care about but it also lets the fleet know what they're killing like are we losing a lot of people but are we also killing a lot of stuff so uh, that's a good intel to have um less less nice but just as important is when what happens when you die um first of all die in in, in peace like dying quiet um there's almost never an instance where you have to announce that you died on Mumble. Uh, a lot of the times it doesn't hurt, but sometimes, especially when the FC is, is trying to get his people out or there's vital intel coming over comms, uh, that one guy pointing out, okay, guys, I died in my, my frigate, uh, isn't really adding anything. Uh, but it is important that you let the fleet know that you died. Uh, so how do you do that? Generally, you put it in fleet chat. So uh, here I died minus one malediction. Here I died minus one logi. Um, especially lo lo logi is nice because it lets the FC know and the rest of logi know that there are lo a logi down. Generally, when that happens, that means there's a lot, a, a lot less repairs going on. So it's it's important that people know that you're no longer there. Um, in case of tackle, it's the case as well, especially if you have not that much tackle, because that can really screw a fleet over. Um, you can have two options. Um, you can call it a day, clone back, jump back in your pot, whatever you want to do. Maybe your pot already died. Um, wait for the next fleet to go out, go up, join standing fleet. Or you can uh, reship into whatever you want. Generally, reshipping into an interceptor is great because no, no, nothing is really going to stop you from getting back to the fleet, right? So uh, that's good. Uh, you can kind of risk it with a frigate but especially you know there's going to be a bubble somewhere with some guy camping it or whatever and you're going to die so i would definitely for a lot of jumps not bother 
Um, I talked a little bit about a bubble just now, and it came up a few times already. So let's start. Let's talk a little bit about the bubbles. Well, a bubble is these awesome blue balls. Um, bubbles are placed items in space by an interdictor. They can be anchored in space, and they will pull ships out of warp, and they will prevent them from warping. You kind of have two types: uh, a normal bubble, which is, for example, placed on a camp when uh, on a gate when you're camping it, and a drag bubble, which is positioned behind the gate and will drag you. No say you're warping to the gate, and there's a, a drag bubble behind the gate. It will warp you out of warp. And not put you on the gate, but behind the gate, making you fly all the way back in order to uh, warp there. Um, there are a few more advanced things here. There are different types of uh, bubbles. Uh, for example, um, in W4, uh, we often bubble the uh, route between the gate from Oka Gigan to the station. Um, so people land in it when they warp or when they warp some, from station. Um, how do you? Uh, prevent that? Well, you prevent that from first warping to a ping, which we'll explain later, and then warping to the station, so you pre prevent from warping on the on the bubble. And general rule of thumb in null, don't warp gate to gate, or don't warp from a station directly to a gate, because if there's a bubble, you will land in it. Go, in, go to uh, a random celestial or something that isn't in line with those two things, and warp from there. So come in at, come in at a different angle. Uh, and uh, interdictor bubbles can be bumped off by bombs and smart bombs, but generally not something um, Horde will uh, apply at the moment. Another important thing that comes up from time to time, especially in big fights, is grids. A grid is basically uh, a sphere in space which dictates what you see on your overview and what you see in space. It's basically a, a game mechanic which um, puts the um, space that uh, that Eve exists in, in different grids, different spheres. Um, this sphere is typically about uh, 250 kilometers in, in, in each direction, so it's pretty, pretty big. But if you do end up at the edge of that grid, and it doesn't expand, because um, sometimes it, 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 it will expand for you, um, that means that, not th that you go to a different grid. And if you're on a different grid, everything in the other grid is no longer visible. So you can literally cross a barrier and either like lose 130 people on your overview or gain 130 o people in your overview. Um, that can, this can be kind of confusing for a lot of new people and it can be really frustrating for experienced people. Um, there are some techniques that allow you to manipulate uh, the grid. There are some awesome resources about uh, about that. There's some people that are really good at it. It's really specific knowledge in EVE. Um, nothing you need to concern yourself with, but just know grids can be manipulated in certain ways. Um, when people talk about off-grid, this is generally means that the person is in, in another grid, like somewhere else in space. And as I said, that doesn't have to be 100 kilometers further. That can be just one kilometer from where you are now because you're on the edge of two grids. Generally, that's a terrible place to, uh, to fight. Um, people will also talk a little bit about, about POSSES. It stands for player on structure. Um, the structure in space has a force field, or well, if it's fueled properly, it has a force field. And it can be placed by a corporation or a POS. Um, Horde has a POS in W4, which we use f as a safe space to war uh, warp to. And the reason why you can use the POS instead of the station is because the station can be bubbled with warp disruption bubbles. So say you're ratting in an anom, it might be beneficial to warp to the POS instead of the station because everyone knows where the station is, but not everyone will know where the POS is, right? So setting up a, a trap around the POS is kind of tricky for a lot of people. Um, they're also used um, for manufacturing and to live out of wormhole. For example, our Wolf Riot uh, wormhole, which we use for isk making, um, has has to have a POS because that's the only way you can uh, store items in a wormhole because there are no stations there. Um, 
Posters in Horde will always have a bookmark, uh, which you can access again by the right click option and then go to co core bookmarks. Um, some posters will have a password. Um, generally in Horde we don't. Um, but just know that if we do get into the situation where you need to enter a password, people will probably explain. But right click on your capacitor and you can set, you can set the password there. Okay, that covers up the second part of the class. Then we have one more part. Uh, which goes over the pretty unique language that um, uh, Eve has. Eve has a pretty specific language, um, which basically has two reasons. FCs want to be um, short and to the point, like they don't want to be confused, uh, con uh, confused or like leave actions up until up to inter interpretation. The other reason is um, EVE is a pretty old game and a lot of those terms grew over time, have specific backgrounds and stuff like that. This makes it very hard for new people to kind of learn this language and know what the hell to do. So um, that's why we're gonna go over like the things I could think of uh, in the next couple of slides. Quickly want to see how long we've been going. That's good, we're still on track. We should probably be done in about 25 minutes or so. Um, we talked a little bit about headshots. Um, basically, what a headshot is, is the enemy fleet targets the FC, either purposely or unpurposely, and tries to kill him. Um, so how do we deal with that? Well, if it's purposely, uh, some FCs will have other persons anchor for them meaning they are perceived as, as the FC. Um, some FCs, a, a lot of FCs will just fly tanky ships so they can survive longer. Uh, as said, Logis pre-lock FCs. And the best way to deal with it is having people willing and able to step up after an, F, an, an FC's headshot. Um, of course, that requires a different set of, um, of knowledge and skills. But at the same time, uh, when an FC dies, uh, there's not much else that can go really, really wrong, right? So uh, uh, stepping up is generally a good thing, even if it's only to get people out. Um, or to finish the fight, that's of course better, but um, that kind of depends. Um, the other thing is manual flying, uh, which is something that is uh, being said a lot. Now, what do we, what do we, de what do we mean by that? What we don't mean is, um, instead of autopilot, you jump gate by gate by gate manually. What we do mean is that you click in space to control where your ship is going. Um, we'll leave that up to a more advanced class as well. But what that allows you to do is advanced maneuvering and gives you more control over your, over your transversal. Transversal basically makes weapons that um, require uh, tracking, tracking of the target, harder to hit. That's that's basically what it is. It's a uh, little, little, little bit of a math formula, bit a little bit of longer explanation, which we're not going to get into right now. But manually flying gives you an edge over just blindly orbiting, because there are ways people can abuse that, and there's ways people can anticipate that, which is not what you want. Um, so, um, if you want to know a little bit more about this, um, there are some great guys on YouTube that are really good at it. Um, so have a look at stuff like that, uh, especially micro gangs uh, on YouTube gets you a lot of good hits for that. Um, hook me up if you want to have some links, but um, this is an essential skill in Eve once you get com comfortable in um, in Eve. Um, it sounds really easy. It's kind of hard to master. Especially in, in, in faster ships. Um, kill mails. Kill mails is basically a report of a kill. Um, it's that simple. There are two ways. There's uh, one in game and one in... Uh, hang on. I lost track of my slides. One sec. There we go. 
So um, how, how do you access your kill reports? You go to your menu, you go to your guy, and then at the combat log, you will see all your kill reports. You open up a kill report, and from there, you can drag it to chat. Uh, this is helpful if you're trying to figure out what the hell happened, or like you want to uh, let the fleet know you died, stuff like that. So that's the in-game version. Um, there's also an outside-of-game version, which basically... Um, our websites that uh, track kills through APIs. Um, C kill and Eve kill are the most common ones. And um, that's something useful to look at. You can pull fits off that. You can get into about what people fly. Um, you can find info of, of what is destroyed. And most important, a lot of people enjoy having a lot of kills on their kill board. Generally not something we really care about in Horto. We don't really care that much about the kill boards. Um, then I want to quickly go over what some modules mean. So a scram originally basically means a warp scrambler. Um, it's a module that prevents people from warping. A point generally means warp disruptor. It's called point because it's, uh, it, it, uh, as you might remember from before, it has one point in warp core strength. Um, generally, we don't make that distinction that much in Horde. When people call for scrams or for points, they don't care if you use a warp scrambler or a warp disruptor, uh, disruptor as long as you get that guy tackled, right? Uh, a web, short for webifier, re reduces the movement speed of the, the person. Then you have EWAR, which stands for Electro Electronic warfare, warfare. It's a group of modules that don't do damage but affect ships in other ways, such as um, reduce tracking speed, reduce uh, target t targeting range, stuff like that. Um, DAMPS is the E-word type that uh, reduces the locking range uh, or targeting speed. That's, the, that, that's basically what I what I just uh, uh, used as an example for E-war. Then you have JAMS, which is also a version of E-war which basically makes uh, the enemy unable to target and, and he will lose its, tar its targets as well. And Nudes, which is a model group that uh, drains the capacitor from the enemy. Then we go to Blue Balls. Blue Balls is a term in EVE that may basically means refusing to give the enemy a fight uh, or the enemy refuses to show up. Um, there are a few reasons. For example, you, you cannot take the fight, so they outship you. If you fight them, you will most certainly die, so you don't give them the fight. Uh, they bring a composition you don't have. For example, people show up at Horde Store with uh, 50 tier 3 cruisers. Well, hello, but like, there's no way we can fight you. Um, you're by far outnumbered, so like, you can undock, but you will get massacred. Uh, or in certain cases, you might not want to give the enemy a fight at all because you don't feel like fighting them. Generally, blue balls are perceived as not, not a good thing in EVE. Everyone wants to have some good fights. But, um, like, it needs to be, like, no one's going to willingly undock into a massacre if it's already decided beforehand, right? There needs to be some common level of chance to actually come out ahead or at least have a good fight. Uh, another not so popular thing, but uh, something I want to cover anyway, is called uh, a Logovsky. Um, it's basically um, logging off to avoid combat or to set up a trap. Um, following scenario. You are hunting for targets, you jump into a system, you find a bunch of miners, uh, you warp on top of them, but they're too fast, because they were actually paying attention. And someone lemming, lemming the gate before you, so they got an advance notice. And they all docked up or in a post now. So something you can do, uh, something that I haven't seen successfully done in EVE yet, but one day, uh, with Horde that is, uh, everyone besides the, uh, 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 the dictator pilot like logs off in the um, place the miners were mining, because he forgot to bring a cloak. Um, then everyone moves out of the system 
you wait a few minutes for the miners to feel safe again. They come back mining. The Dictor logs on. Deploys a warp bubble. The fleet jumps in. Warps to the Dictor or like where they just were. And kills the miners. That's a way that you can use logging off to set a trap. Um, it's a long shot. Like it works but a lot of things need to happen correctly for it to work. Um, another way is say you go harass goons, they drop carriers on you, and there's just like there's no way you're gonna make it out of the system. Um, one way to deal with it, besides just horribly dying, is everyone drops fleet, you get to a safe spot, so you make a save and you go to your safe, you spam D scan. You de deactivate all your models, you hit escape, and you hit log off safely. Then you descan for combat probes. If you see combat probes, it's time to get the fuck out, rise and repeat, and you'll wait until you log off timer. The thing I really don't like about this is that you're telling people to log off and basically call it a night. So generally, we will just make sure people get out, but when it does happen for some important thing, it's nice that people at least have a clue of what it is, so we don't have to go over the full full explanation then and there. Um, another thing, hold the pot. People will generally scream that on comms. Um, holding a pot means uh, holding the pot in place with a warp disruptor, disruptor or scrambler, um, in order to allow everyone to get on the kill mail. Pots can be very expensive, and certain groups are known for flying very expensive pots. So when you catch those groups in null. Those are some nice and juicy kill mails, which everyone generally wants to get involved in. Um, so, what that doesn't mean is shoot the pot, because a pot has very limited hit points. Everyone firing once, or even with five guys, is probably going to pop the pot. So, what you do is you put nudes on it, you put ewer on it, you put webs on it, you put points on it, anything that is an offensive module but isn't going to apply damage. Uh, that way ev everyone can get on the kill mail. And we're all happy. Now here's the slight footnote on that. Due to Horde having a lot of new players, it is not really expected that this ever really happens. Because there's always going to be this trigger-heavy new person, super excited, getting into EVE. He, he finally gets to target something and he's going to shoot it. So, like, again, this is just something, like, keep it in mind. When someone screams, hold the pot, this is what they mean. And try to hold the pot, but... Don't get too worked worked up about it if if this one day old new bean finally gets excited that he can apply some damage in his uh, in his in his tackle uh, Merlin or, or or whatever. Shit happens. Um, Ws and fleet. So Ws and fleet generally mean um, that someone is either tackled when he's in a standing fleet or like some something is warping in on him, or that your tackle has found something to to engage. Uh, w stands for warp. It can also be Xs. Generally, it's one or the other. And um, how do you do that? You do that by oh, that's not that's not an animation actually. I was expecting this to be an animation. I'd have to change that. But you right click on the name. Oh yeah, not now. And then you go to fleet. Oh wow. Warp to member, and then generally warp to zero uh, unless they tell they tell you otherwise. So that's what Ws of fleet mean. Um, you oft, often hear an FC say prop mods on, um, or prop mods on one cycle, um, or prop mods off, or overheat prop mods. Prop mods are basically afterburners and micro web drives. Generally, a fleet will either have micro web drives or afterburners, with the exception of certain fleet compositions and fleet roles. Um, basically, the FCs make these calls to make sure that everyone is still at the same position all kind of close ranges so um, when uh, the FC needs to pull range from an enemy fleet he will say prop mods on and then when he has enough uh, range he will say prop mods off and that's kind of how you uh, position a fleet when you need to pull some range um, as you get a little bit more experience in EVE combat wise you will start to make these calls yourself as well. Like, when when are you falling behind of the uh, anchor, or when are you uh, uh, when wh wh when do you need to pull some range? 
So uh, take that into account. Um, you often hear gate is green, grid is red. Um, it's basically b basically like, like a traffic light. Green means you can jump. Red means you do, do not jump. Generally mean, means when someone says gate is red, when you die, you will die. Or when you die, you give away intel that you don't want to give away. Um, the reason why some FCs prefer to say it like this is because jump and don't jump sound very similar. Um, which we will get to a little bit later as well, but um, just so you know that, uh, what that means. Um, bounds of a safe. Well, we talked a little bit, or actually a lot already about warp bubbles. Um, and you heard me call about, uh, talk about uh, pings a little bit as well. One way to uh, prevent warp bubbles is to bounce off a safe. And that of course is assumes that your safe isn't in the direction of the warp bubble. I want to try and explain this uh, with this little image. Um, this is the gate and this is the warp bubble. So it's it's a drag bubble and it's placed behind the gate. And this is the, the here is the original gate you came from. If you would warp from this gate to this gate, 